Thank you. I want to take the opportunity to really help you be fully informed about how we come to have this opportunity uh, very soon uh, to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and our constitution and to do it in a practical way that gives us the ability to be heard, a voice that can be listened to with the solutions uh, to our many challenges um, and to really improve this nation, our democracy and our identity. Um, but first I want to just um, introduce myself a little bit more um, about how I come to be here as a person advocating for this. Uh, I was a wharfie from when I was 17 years old. That was my first job after leaving school. Uh, so loading and unloading ships in Darwin. Uh, I live and have always lived on Larrakia country in Darwin. And um, it was on the wharf that I got a good understanding of the importance of unity, uh, more than a word that we say at a rally or at a forum like this, uh, because I was a member of the union there. I um, quickly became a, a member of the Maritime Union of Australia. And I was 20 years old when the 1998 Patrick's dispute happened. And um, some of you might remember the Patrick's dispute, but um, for me as a young wharfie, uh, it really shaped me in, in understanding how to stick together. But the importance of structure that comes with unity, you know, the ability to be able to choose representatives yourselves, to be able to hold your representatives to account, you know, with regular elections and monthly meetings or whatever the, um, those uh, systems of, of governance are. Um, the ability to come together as well as people um, to have informed discussion and debate and decide what we were uniting on, what to act with consensus on. Um, <clears throat> the discipline then required and the resources that it takes to bring people together and have those informed discussions. And look, none of this is unusual in a democracy, right? It's just how I came to understand the importance of unity. Um, we have all types of representative bodies, industry associations, business councils, councils, uh, you know, systems of, of you know, nations. Um, but I was really proud to be a part of, uh, you know, being a wharf labourer and, and an MUA member uh, because I learnt about how we had used our unity for more than just our own wages and conditions. Uh, we use the strength of our unity to support social justice struggles. Uh, and what made me really proud was learning how that was used, uh, how we supported Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and our long struggle for rights and recognition. And I'll mention a couple of those things. Uh, the 1946 Pilbara strike uh, was an example. Aboriginal workers on pastoral stations walking off for, uh, for better wages, equal wages and wharfies and seafarers supported them by um, refusing to export cargoes from those pastoral stations in solidarity with those workers. Um, the 1966 uh, Wavehill Walk-Off. If you don't know about the Wavehill Walk-Off, similarly it was 200 Aboriginal stock workers, domestics and their families that walked off Wavehill Station, a cattle station near Catherine in the Northern Territory. Um, and they were walking off for more than equal wages. It became a struggle for land rights, but I just want you to consider this, that um, those workers were doing something like 16 hour days and they didn't have time for recreation or to bury their dead with dignity, with ceremony, as we like to do as human beings. Um, and, if, and they were only getting paid in rations. So just a bit of flour, a bit of tobacco, some sugar and tea, and so if you're working those sorts of hours, if you're only getting the sustenance that you need to work those sorts of hours uh, and you have no time for anything else, it's much like slavery, right? It's more than working for rations. They were protesting against slavery. And it was a, something like nine years. You know the song, From Little Things, Big Things Grow. Uh, Kevin Carmody and Paul Kelly sing that great song about Vincent Lingari and the Gurindji people and that walk-off. And it culminated in that iconic moment when Gough Whitlam travelled to Gurindji country. And many of you would have seen the image of Gough Whitlam, this big white man, and Vincent Lingari, tired and small, 
um, receiving that handful of sand, symbolic of giving some land back for the first time. Now, I'm great friends with the Gurindji people because I, walked, I worked with some of the wharfies, um, they were in their 70s by then, still on the wharf, that had regularly taken supplies from Darwin down to the Gurindji mob uh, during that struggle to help them uh, keep going and to support them. And the Gurindji people are great supporters of this campaign that I'm going to talk about. I think anybody that owns land would understand this. But you see, the Gurindji people, after that handful of sand, they had some land back and they set up a cattle company and a mining company. Vincent Lingari's dream, their people's, the people's dream, was to live on their land their way. And so when they had that cattle company and mining company, they suffered from paternalism, an expectation that they'd run their cattle station in, you know, in a Western way. They just wanted to enjoy working the cattle. They loved the work and they just wanted to enjoy their beef. But they had those sorts of, uh, you know, paternalism and sabotage. Uh, there were people that didn't want them to succeed. And the Northern Territory Country Liberal Party was one of those. Um, it was in power at the time, that party. And so the Gurindji people, when I took the Uluru Statement, the first place that I took it to, um, when, I, when I started to travel with that canvas was Gurindji country, and they got it straight away. And they got it because the elders said, that it was one thing to have some land back, but they needed to have a say about the laws and policies that controlled how they were able to enjoy their land. So they understand a voice. It's one of the reasons why the Gurindji people are great supporters of this campaign. I um, became an official of the union in 2010, and in that tradition continued to organise. And I'm here before you because there were really harmful decisions that were happening. 2014-15, um, you might remember um, WA community closures issue. There was protests all around the country. Indigenous people were protesting because Tony Abbott was the Prime Minister. He had cut over $500 million from frontline community services, led to the WA government announcing they were going to shut off services to communities and cause further poverty or cause those people that had been on those uh, in those places for thousands of years to be forced to leave. And <clears throat> uh, also you might remember when Four Corners exposed the treatment of youth in detention, uh, in youth detention in Darwin at the Don Dale facility. Shocking. Do you remember that? Four Corners. Children as young as 10 years old. Uh, I remember watching it with my wife just, you know, in tears, just seeing and we know today, you know, science tells us, let alone common sense, that if you treat children this way, and almost all of the time in the Northern Territory, this is important to note, all of the children in detention are Indigenous children. But we know that when we treat children this way, we don't help those children, we damage them for the rest of their life. We don't help those families. And in damaging those children and, and uh, causing further harm, we don't help the broader community as well. Youth crime, you know, is an issue. It doesn't help the victims of crime to perpetuate, you know, this uh, disaffection uh, that we suffer from with this sort of treatment. So um, organising the rallies and protests or trying all sorts of things, going and meeting ministers, knocking on their doors, organising petitions, for everything that we were trying to improve our lives to improve our people's lives, our communities and, you know, the broader society in doing that, we just weren't making enough change. The gap this year of 17 measures, four of them have widened. The gap is widening right now. And so the reason I'm here is because I saw that nothing was working. For everything that we've tried, learning the history of our struggle, which I'll go through, nothing is working and I was looking for how we could do things better. And so that's how I got involved in this process that led to the making of the Uluru Statement from the Heart that calls for a constitutionally enshrined voice. And I'm here not because I'm paid by the government to be here, not a government employee, not paid by the campaign. I'm here because I believe in what the Uluru Statement proposes. I believe that a voice is gonna make a difference for all of us 
and with the support of my union for six years I've worked on this full time as an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander man, as an Australian that wants change in this space and I know it'll be good for all of us. So in this presentation I'm going to give you the longer history of the Uluru Statement from the heart. I'm going to give you the contemporary history of it, so you know that where this call comes from, why we have this opportunity. Then I'm going to get stuck into the nuts and bolts of it. What is referenda? What is going to change in our constitution? Should we vote yes? And how is that going to help us? Okay? So the Uluru Statement from the Heart, this is it here, 1.6 by 1.8 metres, as said, it's a canvas. Um, I rolled it up and had it in a patched together postal tube and for the first 18 months from when it was made uh, I took it to as many Australian people as I could to begin the momentum to this moment, working with many others. But it is one of many statements and petitions. Indigenous people since the federation of this country have come together often. We've had our debates and discussions, we've determined the best step forward uh, and always modest proposals we've put to the decision makers and asked for change. This one here is a petition to the King, William Cooper and the leaders of the time in the 1930s. This one is the 1963 Yakala Bark petitions. Now this won't be an exhaustive list, I'm just going to show you several that will show you a, a, a pattern throughout history that informs this moment. But the Yakala Bark petitions with the Yolnu people, the Yolnu people of North East Arnhem Land, one of the passages in this petition goes like this, that we fear that we will suffer the same fate as the Larrakia tribes. And so what the Yolnu people saw was over in Darwin nearby, where that settlement happened and the city was being built as it expanded, they feared that the Larrakia tribes were completely wiped out. And the federal parliament at this time was moving to excise a massive portion of Yolnu land for a bauxite mine. So they feared that su they'd suffer that same fate. And so they made these bark petitions. They took the case to the Supreme Court in the Northern Territory and they lost that case, though part of that decision was a precursor to the success of Mabo um, in the 90s. This one here is the 1972 Larrakia petition to the Queen. Uh, the Larrakia people weren't wiped out and with other Aboriginal people in the region um, they too were seeking um, modest proposals in this petition. You can see on the screen there the thumbprints of our illiterate uh, people of the time. In the bottom left is the patched together Larrakia petition. I show you these petitions because they have a couple of things that are in common, that are important lessons that go into the Uluru Statement. Firstly, all of these statements and petitions, like others, called for political representation or a voice. So consistently, as I said when I was talking about unions and industry associations and councils, Indigenous people sought to be organised, to be able to be heard, to make coherent suggestions about how we can improve our lives. We have always called for a voice. And secondly, these statements and petitions were all dismissed and ignored by the King or the Parliament or the Queen that they were addressed to. I separate this one out, it's the 1988 Barunga Statement. The Barunga Statement, uh, Barunga is a small community near Catherine in the Northern Territory. Bob Hawke was the Prime Minister at the time. You can see him shaking the late great Unipingu's hand. Unipingu, who passed away recently and was celebrated um, at the Gama Festival recently. Uh, one of the architects of the idea of a constitutionally enshrined voice. And the Barunga Statement, again called for a voice. And Bob Hawke promised to deliver on that. The Barunga Statement also called for a national treaty, which Hawke promised, and the Larrakia Petition called for a national treaty as well. But Hawke wasn't able to deliver on the treaty. But he did deliver on the voice. And he established the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission. 
Now, many of you will remember the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, so I'm going to talk about it in a moment. But first, I want to go through this next pattern throughout history that informs the Uluru Statement and our call for a constitutionally enshrined voice. You can see on the screen here, there is, these are, and you'll just notice it's a bit hard to see perhaps for some people, but this, this was, uh, these are representative bodies that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people had established without waiting for a government to do it. Again, it's a natural thing to do. Um, and so in the 1920s, there was the Australian Aboriginal Progressive Association, there was a, the Australian Aborigines League, the Aboriginal Advancement League. These voices were established by our own means, with our allies. And they began to, um, uh, you know, speak to our interests. Now, in common for these voices is that they were all silenced. And these early voices were silenced by pure intimidation. So in those days and in living memory, the powers that be could steal our children, they could direct us to work without pay, they could decide who we could marry, put curfews on us, exile us from country, separate us from our families. So these are the powers that we use to be able to silence those voices by intimidating the leaders or purely by ignoring them. Now these last three representative bodies that I'll talk about were established by governments that were more benevolent. And the catalyst here was the 1967 referendum. 1967 was a referendum to count us as Australian citizens, to count us in the census. And secondly, it was to change the race power, section 5126 of the constitution, that was the power for the federal parliament to make special laws about the people of any race, excluding the indigenous peoples. So what changed in 67 uh, was that that exclusion was removed so the federal parliament can now make laws about indigenous people. I'm going to come back to the race power. But on these voices that were established, that first one there was established under Whitlam, uh, removed by Fraser, and then Hawke got in, removed that one, uh, and soon established the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, which was then removed by Howard. Can you see the pattern? Every time Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have established representation to speak coherently to our interests, to our priorities, to take the solutions to the decision makers, they've been silenced. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, sadly a lot of people believe that it was a failure as if Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are incapable of having a representative body, as if we're different to other human beings. And sadly, some of our own people have been convinced that we cannot, uh, we're not incapable of having representation that we can trust and hold to account. But you see, all organisations have problems from time to time, right? Unions, councils, governments, businesses, all organisations have problems. But what do we do? We update the rules or the constitution. We close loopholes that might be being exploited. We, if it's a democratic organisation, democracy should run its course and the people will choose better leaders. If people are breaking the law, then the law should deal with them, right? If they're committing crimes, they should suffer from the law. Uh, and so <clears throat> our voices, I hope you can see here, have never had that opportunity to evolve. We've never had the opportunity to learn from our mistakes, to choose better leaders. Um, all, always, always, um, our voices are silenced. Howard silenced the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission. He opposed it in opposition when Hawke established it. And as soon as he won, he won power, its days were limited. And the way that was done was the problems that it had were amplified, the good work that it was doing wasn't celebrated. Um, there was an inquiry done, two Conservatives, it was a Hannaford report and Aunty Jackie Huggins into ATSIC. And that report recommended that ATSIC should continue. It was important, but it needed some reform. 
The report was ignored as soon as Howard had the support of the Latham Labor opposition. That voice was silenced as well. Now, the other thing that we learn that goes into the Uluru Statement from the Heart is that every time that we do have a voice, we make improvements, we make progress, we're able to defend against poor decisions. And every time we lose one, things get worse. So the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, as you can see, was silenced in 2005. I want you to think about what happened soon after. The Northern Territory intervention in 2007. Do you remember that? Hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayer money spent on the intervention, intervention by name, intervention by nature, not done with Indigenous people, with those communities, who wanted to resolve those issues themselves, of course. The intervention made things worse. To understand the extent of what happened there, the Racial Discrimination Act Northern Territory was suspended to be able to do that. The Australian Army was used, rolled into those most vulnerable communities in the Northern Territory. And as I said, it made things worse. There was also those funding cuts, and I want you to think about this now, uh, 2014 and 15, when those funding cuts happened and those youth that you hear about with youth crime that I was talking about earlier, they were babies. Many Aboriginal children have fetal alcohol syndrome. Uh, there are those social issues, there's the traumas carried from generation to generation, and losing those services had repercussions to this very day, you know, where those youth that missed out on those services when they were babies or their families didn't quite have them, you know, there's repercussions. And we know that things get worse, as I said. <clears throat> so these were things that we considered. Uh, that's the longer history of the Uluru Statement. The more contemporary history is that when we lost that voice in 2005 and things were getting worse, the gap was widening. 39 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leaders called for a meeting with the Prime Minister and the Opposition Leader. And that happened at Kirribilli. And the Kirribilli Statement was then made. And the Kirribilli Statement calls for two things. It said, firstly, when it comes to constitutional recognition, we support constitutional recognition, it's time. But we support a form of constitutional recognition that is substantive, not merely symbolic, a form of recognition that will give our people greater fairness. Those were the words that were used, greater fairness. And secondly, that we understand that meetings like this can happen and nothing might follow. They called for the establishment of a referendum council to take the question to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities around the country and to the broader Australian public. And so that's what set us on course. Uh, the referendum council was established there were 13 regional dialogues, there were three days each. Um, they had informed debate and discussion. They elected delegates that went to the heart of the nation at Uluru for a final three-day culminating convention. And 250 of 270 of the representatives that were there endorsed the Uluru Statement from the Heart with standing acclamation and tears of joy and hope. Now you might note I said 250 of 270 Indigenous people are no more homogenous than the people of Armadale. Um, there are different opinions, different perspectives, different experiences, but a great majority of us stood as one and endorsed it on that final morning. Now I'm going to recite the Uluru Statement from the heart now, and I hope that you'll feel what we felt in the room back in 2017. We gathered at the 2017 National Constitutional Convention coming from all points of the southern sky, make this statement from the heart. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did according to the reckoning of our culture from the creation, according to the common law from time immemorial and according to science more than 60,000 years ago. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion, the ancestral tie between the land or Mother Nature 
and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes who were born therefrom remain attached thereto and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil, or better, of sovereignty. It has never been ceded or extinguished, and it coexists with the sovereignty of the Crown. How could it be otherwise that a peoples possessed the land for 60 millennia and this sacred link should disappear from world history in merely the last 200 years? With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. Proportionately, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not an innately criminal people. Our children are alien from their families at unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them. And our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. We seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish, they will walk in two worlds, and their culture will be a gift to their country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. Makarata is the culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth-telling about our history. In 1967 we were counted. In 2017 we seek to be heard. We leave base camp and start our trek across this vast country. We invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people. Thank you. Uh, for a better future. Jeez. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, I'm not finished yet. I'm not finished yet. Thank you for getting the hurry up from Barbie. Maybe I'm up to 40 minutes. So um, powerful words, um, a really special moment, a political feat, really. You know, for 250 people, Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people from all around the country with all of our different views and perspectives to reach that consensus is something that really should be celebrated. Um, and the lessons that go into it, just to summarise now before I move on to the nuts and bolts of this referendum, is that Firstly, if our statements and petitions are usually ignored by the powers that be, then we needed to address this one to the Australian people. Because ultimately, we want you to decide if we're recognised in the Constitution in the way that we've invited you to. And secondly, that we need a voice. We make vast improvements when we have the ability to come together and offer the solutions in a clear and concise way to the decision makers for the Australian people to see. Uh, but we need to do it differently this time. We can't just legislate a voice. We can't just set it up on our own. We need the Australian people to help us in this referendum to enshrine it in the Constitution so that it's guaranteed. Okay? Those are the lessons that go into the Uluru Statement. And what I hope that you take away from that is that this isn't Albanese's idea, what we're going to decide on later this year. This isn't Labor. This isn't a Labor thing. Something that should go beyond politics, across the political, uh, you know, the cross-section of politics. This is something for all of us to decide. Um, it, is, um, it is an idea that comes from a long history of struggle, from learning those lessons and from good sense, you know, and, and good thinking. And so I hope that you can see that clearly. But it was dismissed initially, and so for five years we campaigned with very little campaign resources. That's why I ended up doing this, supported by my union, um, because um, that's how I was able to take this to the people. Uh, but others used their university support or you know, gave up their own time 
uh, it was important work that brought us to this point in time where we have a government that is committed to it. So the constitution, uh, we don't have referenda very often. Uh, the last one was in 1999 and it failed. The last successful one was in 1977. Uh, but the constitution defines the power of our government. It's the agreement between the colonies uh, to create the federation. The colonies became the states, so it's how they share power. Uh, and it included clauses that enable Indigenous people to be specifically excluded. Now, I said I would talk about the race power. Many Australians are unaware of section 5126 in our constitution which is the race power. Again, it gives the parliament the power to make special laws for the people of any race, initially except the Aboriginal race. So in the top left there are red words that were removed, that exclusion. And the reason why Indigenous people for decades advocated for that particular change is because the exclusion of Indigenous people from the race power didn't mean that special laws couldn't be made about Indigenous people. It meant that that power was with the states. And the states were particularly cruel and negligent to our people. So we saw it as an incremental step forward, our elders, to see Indigenous affairs taken up by the federal parliament. And that did pay off in some ways. Uh, it has been beneficial in some ways. But since 1967, and this is an important point, the race power has only been used to make special laws about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And I want you to know about a High Court case that's important here. In the 1990s, there was the Hindmarsh case. And it was Aboriginal people arguing in the High Court that the, this race power should be used to make laws to the benefit of Indigenous people, not to harm us. The High Court ruled that it could be used to discriminate to our detriment. This power is not necessarily for our benefit. Okay? And it's one of the reasons we seek a voice. Now I take the time to discuss the race power because there is some misinformation out there about it. The No campaign are telling Australians that in 1967 race was removed from our constitution and we're all equal now under the constitution. This is false. I just explained how it's false. The race power, Indigenous people are subject to it and it can be used to harm us. Okay? How do we change the constitution? The only way is a referendum. We need a majority of voters to agree uh, overall in the country and we also need a majority of voters in a majority of states. So that's four out of six. Um, the territories do not factor into that second count only towards the majority overall. What is the change? I'll go straight to the uh, words that will be inserted in the constitution, should we vote yes. Uh, and I can't quite read that, but I can certainly paraphrase it. I've talked about it that often. But really, after the um, new chapter nine and that heading, uh, section, 129, uh, section 129, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice, 92 words follow. And basically, it says, I'll read it properly, in recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of Australia, one, there shall be a body to be called the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice. Two, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice may make representations to the Parliament and the Executive Government of the Commonwealth on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And three, the Parliament shall subject to this constitution, have power to make laws with respect to matters relating to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice, including its composition, functions, powers and procedures. That, my friends, is what we are voting on. Now, to summarise this, what we are saying yes or no to is the principle of recognition and listening to Indigenous people. Basically, we're saying yes or no to recognising Indigenous people through a voice so we can make representations on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and the parliament decides the rest. Okay. So there is this argument about a lack of detail, but I've just covered the detail, remember? We are voting on a principle of recognition and establishing a voice to be listened to. This is because our constitution is about that thin, 
whereas you know the laws that fall out of those powers that the parliament have you know are much thicker right if we tried to put in the constitution every little bit of legislative detail before we decide that the parliament should have the power to do something like collect taxes or defend the nation or you know set up a public broadcaster we would never have federated could you imagine the the debates and arguments to try and you know, determine every little bit of detail in our constitution in 1901. A constitution establishes the powers that the parliament has, those principles, the institutions, what should um, exist, um, and that's it. So we are voting on that principle, voice and recognition. But there is a genuine interest in understanding how the voice will work. If we were to say it's going to be 24 representatives and they'll be elected in this way and these are the regions and here's the borders, then the danger there is that we would all argue over that. Should it be 24 representatives? Should it be 26 or 30? Um, if also we would be setting up something that people would be voting on something that is false. For example, um, the reason is, is that when the referendum happens, then the legislation uh, for the model is established and we don't know what will pass through Parliament. Okay? But these design principles give greater, a greater understanding. Um, the voice will give independent advice to the Parliament and Government. The voice will be accountable and transparent. The voice will work alongside existing organisations and traditional structures. It will be chosen by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people based on the wishes of local communities. It'll be representative of Aboriginal and Islander communities, gender balanced and include youth. It'll be empowering, community led, in inclusive, respectful and culturally informed. It won't have a right to veto and it won't deliver services. It won't have funding to deliver services. It's purely about shaping laws and policies, uh, influencing uh, those to improve them. This is the campaign. Um, and on Wednesday this week, there'll be an announcement in Adelaide in South Australia about when the referendum will be held. And I believe it'll be mid-October. Uh, and if it is that date, um, the 14th of October, then we only have around 60 days until then. And so the great importance of coming here and speaking with you all is uh, to inform you, um, but I hope also to inspire you. Uh, that they're with an understanding that there's nothing to lose and everything to gain by saying yes. Uh, you know, um, we can gain uh, the means to close the gap uh, and we can all gain over 60,000 years of continuous heritage and culture is something that we can all share. Uh, the oldest living culture in the world, uh, we will become unique in the world uh, in that regard. Um, but I hope to inspire you to volunteer um, to join the campaign yes23.com.au uh, to help us uh, in Armadale and around this region to see an overwhelming yes vote. Thank you. Um, my name is Barry Mill. Um, I've got a property uh, to the east of Armadale. Um, Mima um, Thomas, uh, I'm very impressed with your uh, delivery here this evening. Um, my concern here at the moment is that what we're going to lead to is a driving a wedge between um, two parts of Australia. And I note your comments about democracy. Mm. Um, I don't see that by having an extra voice for a certain part of Australia that we have got a true democracy. And democracy has been the thing that we've fought for and that we hold um, very highly in this, in this community. Mm. Now, by creating a special voice, we're creating a problem. And my challenge to you tonight, um, the problems that you have um, reverted to are cultural issues. And my belief is that if we have a cultural problem, we need a cultural solution. And the example I would use is with the Jewish community, they take ownership of their cultural problem and they solve it themselves. 
Now, why haven't we been able to solve that? Why hasn't the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people been able to solve their own problem? Why are they coming to us, and I don't want to say us, to solve that problem? Thank you for your question. I'll go to this slide here, um, just to remind us all. Um, it's not cultural problems as in an issue with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture. Uh, where do you go? Ah. <laughs> yes. Oh, there you are. Yeah, no, you're right. Sorry, mate. I just wanted to, yeah. No, look, it's not Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture that is the problem. We have a, a wonderful culture uh, and way of life that was developed for, you know, many thousands of years. Uh, we weren't the savages that was said about us for, you know, many years after the arrival of the British and then the beginning of our federation from 1901. Um, the White Australia policy was one of the first policies, you know, that this nation had. Um, we're not unintelligent, we're not different, we don't have a life expectancy of around eight years less because uh, we are different, right? Um, and the issues in our communities are the same issues that you would see in communities that suffer from uh, poverty, you know, from poor water um, supply, uh, from, you know, all of the issues in our communities. Those are what lead to these problems, okay? The, the, the traumas that are carried, and, and science shows this as well, you know, traumas are carried from generation to generation. All right. It affects our children, whether they have lived through that or not. It affects the way that they uh, think and the way they feel about things. Trauma is carried. Um, and there have been so many failed policies okay, and harmful laws. And I mentioned, uh, I don't know if I mentioned, but yes, they could. They could steal our children. You know? Uh, all of these things have led to those problems in those communities. So firstly, I just want to say it's not a cultural problem, okay? This is a systemic problem. And Indigenous people want to take responsibility for our lives. We want to take responsibility for our communities. We do take responsibility. And it is why we have called for a constitutionally enshrined voice, because we are smart enough to see that Every time we have established the means to speak, to have a voice, right, to speak coherently to our issues and offer the solutions and say to the government and to the Australian people, hey, hang on, what you're doing here is wrong. Okay, this is going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars and fail and make things worse. We want that responsibility and every time we set it up, you can't ignore that another government comes along and takes it away. And isn't it wasteful that we should, as taxpayers, spend money, you know, on setting up these representative bodies since 1967 and having them taken all the way back to square one, things get worse, they establish another one, and around and around we go. And so we are seeking a voice to take responsibility because we are sick and tired of policies that fail because it's our lives, it's our people, it's our families, and it's our country, you know? And we shouldn't want our country to be the nation that has proportionately the most incarcerated people on the planet. And again, on that point, it's not a matter of our culture that our children are 100% of the children locked up in detention in the Northern Territory. My children can understand the difference from right or wrong when they have love and guidance you know, and when our families are able to heal from those traumas. It's not that we're different. And I think there's a really important part of the Uluru Statement that goes to your question. You know, proportionately with the most incarcerated people on the planet, we are not an innately criminal people. We're not innately criminal. Our children are alien from their families at unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them. So, mate, I, I really hope that you'll, you know, think deeply about this in the coming weeks. That we want to take responsibility. We just know that we need to take this step. This isn't special treatment. And the Solicitor General, I hope, answers your question as well if you, if you look at what he said about this. 
He basically said that this strengthens our democracy. Because as a democracy, as an egalitarian society, we know that when people aren't being heard, then we take measures to help them be heard. And I, I want to answer this, even though it's not what you asked, but it sort of is. The reason we are voiceless, okay? Because some people say, oh, you've got, you know, indigenous politicians. Well, firstly, indigenous politicians represent their electorates and they're, polit and they're loyal to their political parties, okay? They're not accountable to indigenous communities. Um, but we are only around three to four percent of the population now, where we were a hundred percent, okay? And that three to four percent Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are spread across this great continent, uh, across over 170 electorates. So when it comes to Indigenous people getting the attention of a member of parliament, you know, when, he's prior when he or she is prioritising, you know, what they push for in that place, we are, a, we are the last sort of priority, you know? They can easily harm us and there are no, there's no repercussion democratically. And so this is just important for us being heard to make improvements, okay? So I, I hope that helps. And, and finally, it doesn't drive a wedge between us. As I mentioned, the Constitution has specifically excluded us and that race power is used to make special laws about Indigenous people. This unites us. This connects us in what constitutes us as Australians with a proud and wonderful culture, you know, and a peoples that um, we celebrate today. Our, our children certainly celebrate today. Don't we celebrate, you know, beautiful Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art and song, you know? Let's embrace that. It doesn't drive a wedge, in my opinion. Thanks. Sorry? You don't need to touch that. You okay. Need to touch that. Okay. Yes. Uh, my name is Rosalind Moran, uh, or Moran, and um, uh, I was born in Armadale, <coughs> and I've been, I was away for a long time and came back to live here. Um, on the weekend, uh, I did some door knocking for the Yes campaign, and it was very inspiring. Everybody was very polite, and many people were yes. Um, but today, uh, I received in the post my uh, booklet about the referendum. So this is a much more mundane question about. And I was horrified at that booklet. I don't know if it came from the government. I don't know if you have seen it. And uh, I, I just was really, I felt really despairing when I looked at it because it has an equal amount of stuff about yes and no. And when mm. you open it up, the no statement is there and the yes statement is there over the page. No, yes, no. And anybody uninitiated would probably not even read the yes statement. <clears throat> and it's just such a setup. I was just so upset about it and I don't know if we can complain to the Electoral Commission or what we can do about it, but it's probably gone out to the entire entirety of Australia. Yes, um, the, the pamphlet, people should be aware, isn't fact-checked. It doesn't need to be truthful, and that's one of the great challenges that we have um, up against the No campaign. Ours, our campaign is very clear. You know, these are the words that we're all voting on. That's all the detail, setting up the principle of recognition and listening in our constitution, yes or no. Um, and so it is, it is a challenge. Um, and this is the importance of your door knocking. Uh, the only way that we're going to overcome these challenges, the, the misinformation that is out there, is to have conversations. And so I hope uh, not only do you sign up with the campaign, yes23.com.au and volunteer, uh, with over 150 volunteers in the area. Well done, Armadale. Um, but I, I hope you can all commit to doing this coming out of here, that now that you're informed, um, that you'll work systematically through um, a list that you'll make of everybody that you can possibly speak with, okay? And give them a call, have a cuppa with them, have a conversation, 
And you'll be surprised how many people will just need to hear from you um, that you've looked into it, you know it's safe, you know it's meaningful, uh, you know that um, you're going to vote yes and you'd like them to vote yes too. Um, that's going to make a massive difference. Okay? So thank you. Uh, Thomas, thank you very much for c coming and speaking to us. It was really inspiring. Uh, I'm a convicted yes voter, but I'm also I ha I'm in touch with people who are on the other side. And I'd love to hear from you about speaking to that and mm. pushing away their slogan, the other side, the, this division. I'd love to hear your words on how to think through that. Yeah. Can you hear me? How to deal yeah. with that in our head mm. so that we can strongly talk to yeah. this campaign. That's, yeah. I'd love to hear from you on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, just a bit more on conversations first. Um, be respectful in your conversations. You know, we're going to come ac across people that have a different opinion, of course. Um, and so be respectful. One of my, uh, my advice is to listen uh, to what their objections are um, so that you can understand what advice or what, what information you can give them uh, to take away and to read or, you know, uh, your, your own response. Um, on the matter of division, um, I've already mentioned that really, you know, um, this doesn't divide us. I mean, we're already divided in the sense that there are these, this, there's this great disparity in outcomes as well, you know, and this disparity has existed for a, forever and a day, right? It's not improving much, as I said. Uh, and so this is not about dividing us, it's about uniting us, it's about giving, in, a, in the Australian way, giving the people a hand up, you know, to be able to take responsibility and to make change. Um, and it unites us in our constitution, you know, which is, it's about time. That's not enough to convince them. My next bit of advice is if someone is entrenched in a position and you've worked out that you can never move them, move on. Um, try and find someone that you can persuade. <laughs> Thank you. G'day, Thomas. My name's Mel. Um, just an observation that I've made <clears throat> just here in Armidale, I'd be interested to know if it's reflected in other parts of the country. Um, we all kind of seem to be kind of older people, <laughs> no offence, <laughs> um, but I'm wondering, are young people engaged with the Yes campaign? You know, do you think that the message is getting out to them and do we have a strategy on how to reach them if I've kind of noticed that it's mostly us older people that are into mm. it? Yep. Okay. Well, I, I thought I didn't see anyone over 40 here. What's, <laughs> must be the light. <laughs> now, um, yeah, this, this is uh, common across the country, actually. And uh, usually it's like, where's the youth? We need the youth, right? Well, the youth just get it. That's the difference here. Um, I think it's over 70% of younger Australians are like, yeah, we're voting yes. Right. Uh, and when I've heard the anecdote, you know, of people saying to their younger uh, you know, people come along and they're like, why would I? Like, of course I'm voting yes, you know? Um, and so it's actually the older demographic that is more difficult to convince. And so that's why, you know, we want you to get out there and speak with your peers. Uh, we're really glad. I'm, I'm happy to see all these, you know, grey-headed people here. I wish I had hair like you guys, actually, but anyway. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Thomas. That was fantastic. Um, and I just would like to say that I was voting yes before I came here anyway, and I have three adult children who will all vote yes as well. So, um, yeah, the most confusing thing for me is to see Aboriginal people who are in some kind of parliamentary position or whatever who are so adamantly against it um, I just wondered if you'd you have already mentioned you know that I, un I understand your um, answer with regards to the fact that you know that they're, they're representing their elect electorate but um, yeah that I, I find that really distressing um, because I, I believe that the way the Aboriginal people have the First Nations people have been treated is absolutely appalling Thanks. Thank you. 
Well, um, you've seen what this is about, and I'm sure uh, your local member of parliament has, has seen all of this. It passed through parliament, the alteration. And um, I don't know, I guess you could decide if he's really um, representing uh, the electorate and fair-minded Australians on this. Um, I don't think he is. Uh, but, uh, you know, you guys can decide that. But this shouldn't be about um, political parties uh, or who you normally vote for, and I want to make that really clear. Um, I, I went through the history for that reason. I want you to understand that this isn't, uh, you know, driven by, uh, you know, a, a political party or a political ego. This is backed by a long history of struggle and many lessons that we've learnt as Indigenous people that just make this, um, you know, uh, so logical. Uh, and so um, I want you to reach out to, you know, everybody that you can uh, and let them know that this isn't about what political persuasion you normally are. This is about all of us as Australians and moving forward with reconciliation, you know. Thank you. Hi, uh, Thomas. I'm glad we're wearing the same T-shirt. I'm wearing it every day to between now and the <laughs> referendum. And I will, I will wash it, yeah. Yeah, okay. mine's a bit smelly. <laughs> quick, quick, quick preface, my question is about two books yeah. that pertain to you. When I was about five, there was a, a picture on the Sun Herald paper in Melbourne with an Aboriginal person. And I said to my dad, I don't like that man. Guess what, I'd never seen an Aboriginal person before. Mm. And he, great racist that he was, and noblesse oblige, and uh, ex being in Papua New Guinea, he said, no Marjorie, he said, this, this man, he, he came from this country. You, you can't not, dis you don't, he, it's not about liking. And it was the first time I'd even thought about that. Mm. That stayed with me a lot of years, because I'm one of the oldies here. Mm. Now, second point is, uh, then I met, Char I literally stumbled onto Charlie Perkins, my first day at Univer Melbourne University, and mate, he had more char charismatic than you did. And that's oh, saying what? something. <laughs> Charlie Perkins is one of the most charismatic men I have ever met, right? So that was a bit of luck. And then fast forward a lot of time, I was proud to be on the floor of the Senate when we put Marbo through and I thought that was pretty good. Now this is so important, this is history, and we've got such a commitment for this historical moment because a lot of us will never see it if it doesn't happen, and that's why we've got to get out there. Now my question, sorry. <laughs> yes, you've worked it out, I'm an ex-politician, I can talk under oh, wet right. cement, but for the Labor Party, I'd better just put that up there. Yeah. Now, two books. We bought this one, of course, with your book with Kerry O'Brien, and the other yeah. day, from the lovely Reader's Companion, I got Finding the Heart. And I noticed there was a different spelling of your name. Mm. And the lovely bookshop told me the story, and I think it's a significant story about whether you have the voice. I wondered if you would explain the, the change in your name, because I think it's symbolic of when, when a people lose their voice. Yeah, thank you for your question. Um, no, I, 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 my name was Mayor, uh, you know, always was until uh, at the end of, uh, at the beginning of this year, I changed it to Mayo, removing the R. And that is because uh, I had um, a very special ceremony in our culture in the Torres Strait for my grandma um, just before Christmas, uh, a tombstone unveiling you know, a lot of island dancing and traditional feasting and all that comes with it. It's usually around uh, a year or longer after someone passes away. It's like an end of the morning and reveal the tombstone. Um, and so uh, my family decided because uh, a priest had changed it um, in my father's generation, that we would change it um, to the same as my grandma, which was spelt Mayo on her headstone and my other elders' headstones. Um, so that's why I'm Mayo now. And I'm getting all sorts of stuff on social media now about putting the mayo on, you know, there's lots of immature stuff. They, I don't know, they seem to think that's going to take the wind out of my sails, but it's whatever. Um, but yes, those two books, um, thanks for giving me a chance to give a plug to my books though. Uh, Kerry O'Brien and I wrote the Voice to Parliament Handbook, all the details you need, 
half of the author royalties go to the Indigenous Literacy Foundation. Uh, we never expected to even cover our costs of writing it, but um, it's been uh, uh, so, uh, it's just gone, flowing off the shelves everywhere. Over 50,000 copies are out there now. Um, and I hope you'll find it useful like many Australians have. And the first book, 2019, I wrote it. Um, I've written five books since 2019, two of them are children's books. Um, but uh, it'll help you understand a, a whole lot of stories behind it um, this moment as well. Thank you. But my, my point is, the dispossessor decided that your name should not be what it was. Yeah. And that's why people need, we all need for you, your culture, never ceded to us, to be listened to and respected. And that's not too much to ask, right? To be listened to. Thank you. Gilangay <clears throat> Gogu, that's welcome in Kamegi. Um, my name's Bruce Cohen. I'm a big fan of Marjorie's. She's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, like, thanks for your visit. Um, I just like to say some stuff that. I can I know because mm. I don't like to talk about stuff I don't know because I don't know. Mm. Um, but just about when John Howard got rid of ATSIC overnight um, and how that affected just locally. Um, mm. And I'll CDP. Mm. He, um, like we had three hundred and seventy plus Aboriginal people employed in Armadale alone, which determined you know their wages, you know their lifestyle, their um, you know everything. You know they they got up. For work, you know, self esteem, yeah. self esteem, um, and um, you know, it was working really well. We had contracts with the council, we had contracts with the university, you know, we had the recycling center, we had like young fellas that getting up to work just for two days a week, mm. and then we get had enough much generated money to get them in a like the TAFE course, the training, um, you know, apprentice plumbers, builders, and um, and whatnot, but. Then it was going so well. Then overnight, John Howard just said, "No, it's in the attic." And um, the, basically, the the rug was put out. All of our CDP assets were sold: our houses, our land, our, our employment was ceased, and it all went under administration because of one policy that was working amazingly well. Like it first started back in the like nineties, early nineties, mm. and it you know was going like a good fifteen years, seventeen years. Had young fellas trained in their building, had done their you know certificates and their. <coughs> thank God, a couple of them kicked on to bigger, better things, and what it created was wealth for them, their own families to, to um to build on in a um, but it really you know stopped a lot of um, progress in Armidale and it w Armidale went like average community went back 20 years mm. you know and I'm, I'm just saying this is what I know in Armidale so I couldn't imagine what it did nationally you know it destroyed a lot of communities you know re like remote communities even metropolitan communities that sure ATSIC had its problems but it was really working you know so um you know like I said we could get something I'm sorry I'm voting yes as well like I've very um, even though I've got a lot of like um, like you know, growing up in community, a lot of role models are going for the no vote, which is their um, you know, you know and, and I really respect what they have to say, and I still do. So, hmm. and that's their um, opinion. So, but um, like I said, it's it's if we can get something in the constitution cemented there, you know, that's a good start for my grandkids and my great grandkids. You know. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, brother, for sharing that. Um, your, what you are talking about, I have travelled extensively in the last six years to so many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, and they lament that same thing, that a program for employment was working really well uh, and it was just taken away and what it was replaced with was just, you know, useless, uh, a failure, you know, and it was continued for many years despite us trying to say that this isn't working, we should go back to the way that it was going before. And just another example is there was, uh, I was just in a community recently 
not that long ago, only a few weeks ago. And they were talking about there was 70, this program had 70 early childhood centres um, around the country, all around the country. And they were doing, they were working really well, you know, with helping families get their kids to school and, and all of this type of thing. Um, and that also was taken away at a whim with no real explanation, you know, no replacement, uh, something that was really improving our communities and our lives, just taken at a political whim uh, and no voice to defend it and help the Australian people see, hey, you know, this is something that's working. Um, of course, we speak up, you know, we say we, we have a voice now, you know, we do, we protest and all that. But my point earlier is we're taking responsibility when we're doing that to go to that earlier question, but it's just not cutting through. You know, we, we need the Australian people to, to vote with us, you know, to say, hey, it's, we're setting up the expectation that parliament and the government will listen to the solutions and act on them. Thanks. Jingri. I'm from the Bundalam Nation and, um, yeah, originally, and my name's Catherine Hegarty, so. Catherine. Yeah. Um, thank you for explaining the history. Um, that's what I actually want to see in our education department. Um, and it's not, it's not happening today. And I do have a child of mixed race. So this is actually a personal issue when I realised in Armidale that if I lived here in the previous governments, they would have come and questioned me. Um, just the fact that I was a mother to a child of mixed race. Mm -hmm. So that was very confronting for me. And um, <clears throat> so, but I, I feel my story is, is pivotal for the Caucasian population to realise it's not just the Indigenous that need to reconcile their future, it's also the Caucasian people. Um, um, the first question that you had about um, whether your people actually want to um, I just wanted to also share an example from the disaster because that sort of, I think, it wasn't what, what happened in the disaster, it was the response afterwards. And the Indigenous people, they showed a level of resilience and a level of aptitude and quickness and they didn't judge skin colour. I helped a cafe at Fingal and she described how the Indigenous population in that area um, automatically came to help her cafe. They, they dug the, the dirt. The, the mud to make her cafe um, workable because, uh, and then I myself, I pointed out to New South Wales Resilience, the cafe, the fish shop for mental health reasons needed um, people to go there and it to be functional. Um, <clears throat> so after that, and then also like, um, the term cultural competence and awareness, I also haven't seen that discussion and so when I first started questioning my own like knowledge of Indigenous matters, um, I was a bit surprised that healthcare workers in the Aboriginal space, this is what they learn and there's actually Cultural Competence Australia, so I actually rang them up. So that was also like, I feel for me being a Caucasian person, I've got the Western viewpoint, like that's how I grew up. So I feel that's also pivotal to the discussion and us reconciling the cultural competence term, yeah. Thank you. No, you're so right. It's important to all of us, all of us this moment. It's not just about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It's about all of us. Thanks. My name is uh, Arun, and uh, I'm living in Australia for the last 30 years and uh, immigrated from India. And social justice is definitely one of the things that is of concern to me. And uh, the condition of Aboriginal people really uh, something that, like, you know, disappoints me that uh, as a community we are not doing enough. Uh, I'm going to vote uh, yes. Uh, but I do think that within what you are proposing, it doesn't feel very concrete. It, you, you can do that without a constitutional change. Like you can set up a 
body which can advise, why would you need to change the constitution? Yeah, thank you, Arun. Uh, I appreciate your question uh, because um, I'll just point out here, Arun, remember I talked about the representative bodies that we've established that have been taken away before. So when Indigenous people considered the history of voices, uh, we had to consider that if we were to just legislate a representative body again, then we would be setting ourselves up to fail because you cannot ignore that pattern of voices being taken away every time. But I think there's something else that I haven't talked about to answer your question uh, a bit further. To recognise a people in the constitution, doesn't it make sense to ask the people how they wish to be recognised? Yeah? And so that's what happened in 2017 after that long process of dialogues and discussions all around the country. We said we seek to be recognised through the establishment of a voice. Okay, so it's the form of recognition that we have proposed. And I think that's a really important thing to consider. Thank you. Hi, Thomas. That was brilliant. Um, Thank you. So my name is Ryan, and I've got two questions. It's um, it's a bit hard to predict the future, but um, what happens with the referendum if it passes, and then what happens if it doesn't pass? Yes, if it passes, we will establish a voice. So uh, I, I take this opportunity to talk about the process. So the referendum passes, okay? Then the government goes to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities around the country, has further uh, dialogues about how the model should work. Okay, so how many representatives, what the regions are, the process of election, those types of things. Then they set that up in a, in a bill to parliament. It'll then go through a parliamentary process as our democracy works, um, a joint select committee. Um, the Australian people get to have a say uh, about that model. Indigenous people get another say. Uh, then it'll go back to the parliament with whatever recommendations. And then the parliament debates the model, the legislation, passes through the upper and lower house and away we go. Um, Indigenous leaders have said that we would like that process to be completed before the next election so that we can start to influence policies around education, as was discussed, uh, and employment, uh, those types of things to improve our communities and everything. Um, so if it passes, that is the journey that we're going to be taking. We will have a voice that is able to improve policies and laws. And, uh, and on this as well, actually save money because we'll see better outcomes for every dollar spent in Indigenous affairs when we have a voice. But it'll also save lives, right? So save money and save lives. What a great thing that is. Um, uh, and so, you know, that's the, the future that I envision when we have a voice. Um, the reason I do this is because I, as an Australian, cannot accept um, that our people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, are so marginalised and there's such a gap. Um, and I hope that you can't accept that either and you'll vote yes. But the future that I want to see is one without a gap. Okay? That's the sort of future that I want to see. And I also want a future where, like other countries, we're the only country, like nation, we're the only like nation that has not constitutionally recognised Indigenous people. And our friends across the ditch, you know, the Māori people and in New Zealand, um, there's not a written constitution in New Zealand, but they have foundational documents, much like a constitution. And the Treaty of Waitangi is one of their foundational documents. And they have a representative body uh, that is very effective in improving their conditions. New Zealand doesn't have proportionally the most incarcerated people on the planet. We do. And I think uh, I hear this often from people how they admire how, how, how much they celebrate Māori uh, culture as something that they all share, right? Something that makes them unique in the world. And that's the future that I want to see as well, where we truly embrace Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture. And, 
it's it's not to say that we can't celebrate other things that make us Australian, you know, like barbecues and mateship and thongs and I mean going to the beach, you know. These are Australian things that we can still celebrate, you know. Um, we can we can do all of it. It all it all together makes us Australian. Um, but to if we should fail, I really can't contemplate that. Um, I am going to work every day, you know, between now and the referendum with you, I hope, as volunteers in this campaign to see that we win. Uh, because losing is not just the status quo. Uh, brother there, we were talking about self-esteem. Imagine what this will do. You know, it is a modest proposal. It is a generous proposal. Imagine what this will do um, to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people if this should go down. You know, what does that say? Thank you. Good day, Tom. Good day. Uh, my name's Jack. Um, I'll, first, I want to thank you so much for um, really encouraging a culture of respectful dialogue and encouraging you know, people to always to be respectful to anyone who you're talking to. Um, if that ends up being part of, if that culture ends up being part of the voice, I, I'd be, I'm very happy with how things will go, um, just personally. Um, the question I wanted to ask you was about, um, and forgive my inf ignorance about this, was about the concept of uh, culturally informed practice. So, uh, you said that the voice would be culturally informed, and I just wanted to know a little bit more about how that kind of works and how that would probably work in the voice structure. Yeah, okay, it's a good question. Um, I think those representatives, you know, uh, coming together, uh, you know, chosen from their communities will have, will decide those things. Um, but just as an example, um, is the inclusion in the design principles that we talk about. Uh, and gender balance is something that has always been said in the dialogues in at Uluru, as some, is, is something that we hold as important to any representative structure that we um, establish. Um, because that's part of our cultural protocol, you know, to ensure there's a space for men to have discussions amongst themselves and women to have discussions amongst themselves, but still be able to come together in a plenary type thing. That's just one example. Um, I couldn't tell you what the rest will be as far as the, the body and how it will um, set its protocols, but I think that'll be up to those reps and their communities. Thank, Thank you. you. Inagay Thomas, my name's Hazel. I'm from, this, um, from the two tribes, Nations of Amara, Kumbangi and Anawan. And um, first of all, I want to thank you for coming here, brother, because um, th we need change. Mm. We need change. I've, um, I've um, went to a conference in um, Canberra because I was um, skeptic about voting yes, even as a First Nation person until I went to Canberra and I met, and um, there was a big uh, First Nation women's conference, I can't remember the thing, mm. and they had, the, they had the who's who of the um, Indigenous women, uh, First Nation women in, um, in their hierarchies. Mm. And uh, June Oskin, and he had Linda Burney, Rachel Perkins, all these beautiful women, and women, there's over 900 women from all across Australia. And you know, the voices, the voices were strong. And you know, us, can I share? Yeah, yeah. Us Aboriginal people, we're not down here no more. We, we up here, we together. We want our nation to come together. Yeah. And you know, yeah. <laughs> so I hope I don't go take too long. And uh, we have the most beautiful, like you said, the culture. Uh, we do celebrate our culture. We, we share, we learn in our language. Our young fellows are going to um, university. Our old people have fought, they fought hard for, our, for us to get housing, education, health, you mm. know? And, um, you know, I'm, I'm so uh, happy that, that we have a chance, Australia finally has a chance, not finally, but yeah, that we have a chance, sorry, people, to step forward, 
mm. to be recognised. And you know what? I I fully support them them ladies and them men that are that are going to be the voices for us in Parliament because if we have them. They are they are um, have good principles and good ethical values, you know. And um, so yeah, I like to see us if. I would dread if uh, this referendum never went through. We'll go backwards. So thank you very much. So what do you reckon? Are we voting yes with Arnie Hazel? Thanks. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone. Voices for victory, not yeah. failure! <laughs> victory! <laughs> uh, the last referendum on this matter was 67, and I happened to be in this town. And uh, I can only say, Jimmy Smith and Kim Ahoy, for the two years they put up uh, posters at every church every weekend. The cathedrals handed them out for two or three years. They're magnificent. And not only that, Jimmy had the voice. Do you know what he was? He was the first bloke in this town, Aboriginal, to get a home in here for rent. And it was from a detective sergeant. <laughs> and uh, Jimmy is also the first man to pick up on the Treaty of Watangi and the, uh, the, uh, the other thing, the Makarata. And uh, he took a plane flight over to New Zealand and he was supported by Lyle Munro Senior out in Moree and he came back with that. That was what the voice brought to this town, this very town. And at that time, the other thing which is essential to this town were the people together for six or seven years. The whole town was behind the Aboriginal thing. It finally diminished with the change of government, but it was important in native title. And the other person, well, there are many from the white tribe, but on the Blacks tribe was, um, what was his name, Kelly. The, uh, he was the bloke in charge of the plant at the council, mm. Jimmy Kelly. His, and uh, native title for the uh, national parks here grabbed him to be part of a group looking at native titles. And they did draw up native titles for your national parks and everything else. Thanks, mate. And, uh, yeah, uh, mm. what I'm getting at is mm. there needs to be a return to this, to the victory of the truth. And, and I'll say one last thing. Charlie Perkins started up at the Wayside Chapel in the top, uh, in the second floor there, and we used to meet there a number of us, and he had the, uh, his office was the uh, cleaner's uh, area and he used to pull out these uh, things we used to sit on and then Andrew Rafchorgi took that down to the university to the retreat. Also I'm saying all these people did it before and I see Cedric brings up the back what a, what a colossus, what a giant he has been and all the others. Very Thank good. you. Thanks Bob. Okay, yes, how you going? Um, how's that? That's cool. Thanks, guys. Um, Mima, uh, I, I just want to um, not have the final say, but I want to give a personal say, a personal thing, and I can relate to what Bob Cummins was just saying. Um, I was part of that era too. I was a young teenager when I was in 67, and that enlightened me and woke me up. Uh, and probably helped me develop into the person that I am today, interested in change and um, vision and new ways of doing things. Um, as a 
an Aboriginal person from here and, and with uh, involvement on a state and national basis in, in uh, improving and advocating for Aboriginal people all my life. And I was a member of the ATSIC, the Regional ATSIC Council here, the Camilleroy Regional ATSIC Council, when it was abolished. And I become a member of the National Aboriginal Congress as well. And that was abolished. So the voices were taken away. Yeah. And here I am, I'm standing here, I come from a, and as, as do all Aboriginal people who are present here today, um, we come from a, a long line of people who had good governance, good law, good order, and they had a voice. They had a voice uh, for their um, communities, for their families, their countries. All that worked very well for thousands of years because they had that voice and they had the respect and they knew how to sit down and communicate and talk with each other and d how to make decisions. I'd like to go back to that, you know, and the way we can do this, I know most of the people in this room, I can't see very well, but I can feel it. Most uh, would be in support of a yes vote, but you would know people that are very supportive of a no vote too. I'm urging you all to talk to your friends, as, as Mima Thomas did, uh, urge you to uh, be respectful and talk to uh, your friends about the important issues. Not ones that think, uh, you know, that, that, that you might think will divide us. Um, Mima, Mima Thomas said, um, it'll bring us together. This will unite us all. And it will also show the rest of the world how we treat our indigenous people. Mm. Um, you know, and we, we the only country in the world that doesn't have have the, um, you know, recognition of indigenous people. That doesn't yeah. go down very well, really. And we're the oldest living culture in the world here, the oldest living culture, and we still don't have proper recognition. Um, but what, what I, um, I'm forgetting what I'm going to say. <laughs> Time marches on, Stephen. Uh, look, I'll, ju I'll, just, I'll just wind it up, Bar, very quickly. Talk to the people that you, who you need to persuade about two things. One, the actual question. The question, 92 words, Member Thomas said. Talk about that question. That's the one that we're voting on. Don't look at everything that's the peripheral stuff all around it. Talk about that question. Um, that's, that, that's what we're going to vote on. And what was the other thing, Bart? <laughs> look, I don't, I don't know, but I'll be happy to talk around... around um, Oh, look, I know I'm here. Uh, but I, I think 97% of the people are uh, non-Aboriginal. We're only 3%. As Mima Thomas said, we, we used to be 100%. But it's the plea from the Uluru Statement... Says, oh, that's what I was going to say. Read the Uluru Statement, understand it. It's a plea by those 250 people at Uluru to the rest of our uh, fellow Australians to say... Uh, we have tried this before for a voice, and Mima Thomas explained it many times. It was always knocked back. This is our only chance, our only chance, um, and uh, to, to do this and to change it. And let's go back to the last referendum, 1999. Republicans had come out and said no. There's been no talk about the republic ever since then. Mm. If there is a no vote for this. There'll be no discussion, there'll be no changes. Nothing changes while nothing changes. If there's a yes vote, it opens up the conversation and gets things happening. With your support. Thank you. Uh, that means big thank you there, Minma Stephen. Um, so, shall we... Two more questions, yeah? Yeah, the two more questions. No, st not statements, quick questions. <laughs> And I'll be short as well. Uh, thanks, Thomas, for the great presentation. My name is Salam Karan. I'm from the Azidi community. So this may be the first time you see the Azidis uh, around here in Australia. The people of my community, we are more than 5,500 who lives in Australia now since 2017, late 2017, 18. So we are definitely with 
yes, but there is people, unfortunately, who support no. They, what they say to the community, they say, if you vote yes, and if this passed to the parliament with yes, and it's been mm. successful, then the Aboriginal people would not allow the other communities, like EGD communities, to enter Australia. Yep. And the other thing about this referendum that the EGD community didn't get the right information and haven't got like enough information in our language because we are non-English speaker. Mm. And what I can do from my side, uh, like personally, I can create a video in our language and be happy to be shared in your company. Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Salam. It's wonderful. Final question. Just come down a bit. Am I right like that? Thomas, I've got two questions on the process, but I need yeah. to give context of what my question's come about. Mm. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Bradley Witters. For the last six years, majority of the last six years, I've been one of your local friendly councillors on the Armidale Regional Council. And holding that position in this town, a lot of people have come to me and are looking for advice on the voice. Mm. Mm. And for a majority of the time, I've said, read the Uluru Statement and make your way from there. There's enough information out there um, from there. Uh, back to the original question, the first question from over here, um, about don't we already have a voice? Now, I'm one person within local government. I have to fight harder to get my viewpoint and the, what my community needs across more because I need the majority to support what I'm doing. I'm only one voice. And you, it goes back to the old tale of the grasshopper and the ant. One ant can't influence a grasshopper, the grasshopper being the government. A thousand ants influences a grasshopper, and that's what the voice is. It's a thousand ants together. So remember that, all right? We can have our voice inside, and we can have our representatives, but if they don't have the numbers, they're just going to get shot down. And so a collective voice makes what we're trying to achieve stronger. But my questions are two things. The local, state, federal concept of mm. the voice, mm. how does that go about? And the second question is, if the government legislates it, what's to stop the government to say, whether you're conservative or whether you're a progressive government, saying, all right, we want to legislate our voice to look like two people. That's our voice. We want our, the other side says, we want our voice to be 20 people. Does the whole process need to be changed only on who's in power or does it need all of the parliament, power and opposition, to pass the change on what the voice looks like? Yeah, thanks, Councillor, um, for your questions. Um, firstly, on the matter of... Um, oh, what was the first part? Sorry. Uh, yes, yeah, so local... Um, so the, the body, uh, there's... It'll be local, regional and national, OK? So there will be... Uh, it's, it's how representative bodies work, right? So... Uh, but as far as the states go, that's what your question was about. Um, uh, the voice... So there are things like health and education that are a responsibility of the states, right? Uh, and so where there are common issues uh, in those spaces around the country, the voice is going to have an impact by, you know, raising that these are common issues and uh, promoting uh, programs and policies that are working uh, across the different states. Um, there's also the National Cabinet where the voice could table advice there and speak directly to the premiers of states. Uh, and so that's another way that it can influence uh, state matters. Um, the last part of your question was... Uh, the setup that hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the thing that protects the, um, the way that the body works, as in being representative, um, or stops the government from saying, OK, it'll only be two representatives now, and we say who they are, is the intent of the constitutional change is that it's an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice, okay? But also the voice may make representations. So that word's important, you know, it's the ability to make representations. And so the Australian people are voting on, um, you know, a representative body. And that is what gives it its greatest, greatest protection. Yes, a government can uh, change the model to try and undermine it, but it is the, the way that it is passed through a referendum, the Australian people setting up that expectation, it's democracy itself 
that is, it is its greatest defender. And of course, the voice itself is going to speak and always advocate for the strongest possible model to see our people are heard. So it's not a perfect protection, um, but you know what is guaranteed is that we will have a body to be called the voice and it can make representations. The rest is up to us. Um, I hope that answers your question, brother. Thank you.